Hello and welcome to video 3 for week 5 for Math 300. This video is not strictly a continuation of the first two in this week. We did some stuff on curvilinear coordinates in those first two videos. This is more an introduction to the next couple weeks to come. One of the major goals of this course is to extend the notions of calculus to multivariable situations, and this is the first time we're going to do that by defining a vector-valued function. So what is a vector-valued function? So this is a function its domain is still in the real numbers, so its domain is like all the domains we've had. Usually this is going to be an interval, could, but it could be any subset of the real numbers. But the output now has multiple variables, multiple components, multiple dimensions. And how we write this is we think of this, usually we write these in terms of t. Um, t is the conventional variable for these vector-valued functions for reasons that we will see next week. Uh, and we write this in components, because if it outputs to a vector in our n, well, it needs to have a first component and a second component all the way up to an n component. And so we get component functions of it. So a vector-valued function is composed of several component functions, f1, f2, all the way up to fn. And these component functions together give us a vector. If this goes out to r2, often we'll write the components in terms of x and y. So we think of the x coordinate is a function of t, and the y coordinate is a function of t. If this is an R3, likewise we'll think of x of t, y of t, z of t. So these are the components, and these can be entirely independent. The setting of x, y, and z based on your variable t can be entirely independent, entirely different kinds of functions. But for every input t in some domain of the real numbers, we're going to get an x, a y, and a z, and that's going to give us a point in R3, or in R2, or in Rn. So that's the idea of a vector-valued function. I want to do the sort of most basic calculus of those in this particular video. Again, this is just an introduction this week, and we'll get into more details next week of how these are used. For limits of these, we just do the limits component-wise. Each component itself is an ordinary single variable function. This first component is just f1 is just a one variable, one input, one output function. f2 is a one variable, one input, one output function. So I can take the limit of all of those things. And so this limit exists, limit of f exists, if and only if all of these other limits exist. If any of these fail, then this limit fails. All of the pieces have to make sense. We can also talk about continuity, and the definition of continuity is exactly the same as before. A function is continuous if its limit is the same as its value. So this is what happens as t approaches a. t approaching a still happens in the real numbers. The input to all of these functions is still in the real numbers. Um, so this is going to be approaching. It approaches some vector. And if it approaches the same as the value of that function, so if the function is getting closer to its actual value, then we call the function continuous. This is harder to see and harder to draw because we don't necessarily have nice graphs of these things because they have too many variables. But the algebraic formal definition still makes sense. Function is continuous if its limit and its value are the same. And we can also define derivatives. And there's nothing new here. These derivatives are just derivatives component-wise. So the derivative of a vector value function is just the derivative in each piece. And if this was a function in R2, then the derivative would just be the derivative in the x-coordinate and the derivative in the y-coordinate. In R3, the derivative in the x-coordinate, derivative in the y-coordinate derivative in the z-coordinate. These functions just have multiple outputs, and we can take limits in each output, and we take derivatives in each output, and we say this derivative exists only if all of these possible derivatives exist. So if any of these fail to exist, then the function is not differentiable. Before I finish this video, I want to point out one thing here, which is quite important. This immediately gives us some interpretation problems. Because for single variable functions, we have this strong interpretation of derivatives as rates of change and slopes of tangent lines. Now the derivative is a vector, and a vector is not a reasonable thing to be a rate of change or a slope of a tangent line. So now we have to come up with an interpretation. What does this vector mean? Does it measure rate of change in some way? Does it measure slope in some way? Do those things even make sense for vector-valued functions? In the next two weeks, week six and week seven, we're going to get into the theory of parametric curves, which are a way of understanding what vector-valued functions are geometrically. And in that context, we're going to give a very robust and very fascinating interpretation of these derivatives 
in the context of parametric curves. So I will stop this video and this week now and wait for future weeks to get into the new interpretation of what this derivative means in this new context.